And if the lake reaches that point, if it continues to rise, it starts flowing over what we call our emergency spill, our auxiliary spill. The, uh, the lake continued to rise uh, through the week to um, a point where um, the lake was filled. It reached its full pool elevation. It, well, it could uh, it could jeopardize the structure that the um, the um, auxiliary spillway is, is built on. We're releasing less water from Lake Orville than was coming into Lake Orville. Um, the lake was increasing because we had, this is back, you know, it was raining. California's most critical dam just did something impossible. In the dead of night, while millions slept peacefully in their homes, Lake Oroville's water level climbed 23 feet without warning. No rain fell, no upstream dams opened their gates. Yet 7 billion gallons of water appeared from nowhere and the engineers monitoring the situation aren't just confused, they're terrified. At exactly 2.17 a.m. Pacific time, a routine sensor reading triggered an alert that would send shockwaves through California's water management system. The telemetry station on Oroville Dam's east abutment registered something that defied the laws of hydrology. The reservoir's surface elevation had jumped dramatically, and it was still climbing. By dawn, the impossible had become undeniable. Control room technicians watched in disbelief as their instruments painted a picture that shouldn't exist. Every backup system, every redundant gauge, every independent monitoring station told the same story. Lake Oroville was filling itself. The numbers were staggering. In less than four hours, the water level had risen from 847.3 feet to 870.1 feet. For context, that's equivalent to adding the volume of thousands of Olympic swimming pools every single hour. Engineers who'd spent decades managing water systems had never witnessed anything remotely similar. When the sun finally rose over the Sierra Nevada, field crews rushed to the shoreline expecting to find equipment failure. Instead, they discovered a transformed landscape. Water had crept inland by more than 60 feet. The intake tower, normally surrounded by exposed rock and dry ground, now had waves lapping at its lower platforms. Marker buoys installed months earlier floated in positions that defied their GPS coordinates. Driftwood and debris rested on benches that should have been 10 feet above the waterline. The shift supervisor's logbook entry would later become evidence in an emergency declaration. His words were simple but chilling. The shoreline has moved. This is not instrumentation drift. To understand why this event sent California's water authorities into crisis mode, you need to know what Lake Oroville represents. This isn't just another reservoir tucked away in the mountains. It's the beating heart of California's water system, the linchpin of the largest publicly built water conveyance network on Earth. 27 million people depend on water that flows through its gates. The Central Valley's agricultural empire draws its lifeblood from these waters. When Oroville hiccups, California holds its breath. The dam's turbines generate enough electricity to power a city of 800,000 residents. Every foot of elevation change translates into millions of gallons of water and billions of dollars in economic impact. And if the lake reaches that point, if it continues to rise, it starts flowing over what we call our emergency spill, or our auxiliary spill. We uh, have had a, a problem with our spillway all week, started uh, back on uh, Tuesday of, of this last week, and, uh, because we didn't want it to have, we knew we were going to have some erosion with, uh, you know, by running water over the existing, uh, the resisting erosive hole. We're releasing less water from Lake Oroville than was coming into Lake Oroville. Um, the lake was increasing because we had, this is back, you know, it was raining. The, uh, the lake continued to rise uh, through the week to um, a point where um, the lake was filled. It reached its full pool elevation. Right. It, well, it yeah. could, uh, it could jeopardize the structure that the, um, the, um, auxiliary spillway is, is built on. But beyond the statistics lies a darker truth, one written in the traumatic memories of 2017. That February, nature tested Oroville Dam like never before. Torrential rains pushed the reservoir toward its limits, forcing operators to activate the main spillway. Within hours, disaster struck. A massive crater opened in the concrete chute, sending debris and muddy torrents cascading down the hillside. When engineers switched to the emergency spillway, an earthen overflow that had never been used at full capacity, it began eroding within minutes. The head cuts advanced toward the dam crest with terrifying speed. Authorities issued evacuation orders for 188,000 residents downstream. Families fled in the darkness with whatever they could carry. It became the largest dam-related evacuation in American history, and the scars never fully healed. For communities along the Feather River, any anomaly at Oroville triggers visceral fear.
the sight of rising water, the wail of sirens, the memory of midnight evacuations, these aren't abstract concerns, they're lived experiences etched into collective memory. As news of the unexplained surge spread, the California Department of Water Resources activated its incident command structure. Dam safety teams assembled at the operations center while inspection crews deployed to every accessible sector of the embankment. Communication logs recorded a cascade of notifications to federal partners and downstream water districts. Field investigators arrived at the reservoir's edge armed with GPS units and sampling equipment. What they found challenged their understanding of basic physics. Access roads designed for drought conditions now ended at water lines that hadn't existed 24 hours earlier. Mud flats that should have been bone dry were completely submerged. Then came the first breakthrough, and it only deepened the mystery. Water samples traveled under strict chain of custody to the central laboratory. Technicians ran standard tests first, conductivity, turbidity, basic chemistry. But when the advanced results started arriving, jaws dropped across the lab. The water filling Lake Oroville wasn't normal. Lithium concentrations exceeded typical surface water values by four times. Boron levels matched signatures found only in deep geothermal systems. Rare earth element ratios pointed toward water that had spent decades, maybe centuries, in contact with basement rock far below the surface. Stable isotope analysis confirmed what seemed impossible. The oxygen-18 and deuterium ratios fell completely outside the range expected for Sierra Nevada precipitation. This water hadn't fallen from the sky, it had risen from the depths. The implications sent chills through the scientific team. If deep aquifer water was somehow finding its way into the reservoir, it meant something fundamental had changed beneath their feet. Seismic records revealed a potential smoking gun, a cluster of small earthquakes beneath the lake's eastern arm, perfectly timed with the water surge. The tremors were minor, magnitude 1.2 to 2.1, barely enough to rattle a coffee cup. But in fractured rock systems, even small earthquakes can open pathways between deep aquifers and the surface. Pressure differentials could drive enormous volumes upward through newly opened conduits. But a competing theory emerged that was far more terrifying. Engineers familiar with dam failures recognized disturbing patterns in the data. Internal erosion, known as piping, begins invisibly. Water finds microscopic paths through an earthen dam, carrying away soil particles grain by grain. The channel gradually widens until catastrophic failure becomes inevitable. Turbidity spikes in the dam's drainage galleries aligned perfectly with the water rise. Piezometer readings showed pressure anomalies that hadn't occurred since the 2017 crisis. The temporal correlation was too precise to ignore. History is littered with dams that failed due to internal erosion. The Teton Dam in Idaho collapsed in 1976 after piping undermined its core. The St. Francis Dam disaster in California killed over 400 people when undetected seepage led to catastrophic failure. In each case, early warnings were present but minimized or ignored. An external engineer was brought in to provide independent verification. Her mandate was clear. Challenge every assumption, verify every data point, and ensure institutional blind spots didn't compromise public safety. She ordered acoustic Doppler profiling to map any subsurface flows, dual isotope analysis from independent labs, and comprehensive piezometer gradient studies. The answers would take days. The water kept rising. On Lakeshore Drive, Maria Delgado watched the water creep toward her property with growing dread. She'd lived through the 2017 evacuation, loading her elderly grandmother into the car at 2 a.m. while sirens wailed through the canyon. Now that familiar fear had returned. We're not waiting for an official order this time, she said, carefully stacking photo albums into waterproof containers. Her voice carried the hard-earned wisdom of a community that had learned not to trust reassurances. Emergency bags waited by every door. Gas tanks stayed perpetually full. The lessons of 2017 were written into daily routines. Downstream, environmental monitors registered the first signs of ecosystem collapse. Turbidity levels in outflow channels exceeded critical thresholds for salmon spawning habitat. Decades of sediment-bound metals threatened to mobilize. Water treatment facilities reported chemistry changes that their systems weren't designed to handle. Behind closed doors, competing narratives battled for dominance. 
agricultural districts wanted explanations that would protect their water allocations. Urban agencies demanded supply guarantees. Environmental groups questioned whether decades of deferred maintenance had finally come due. Some stakeholders quietly hoped for the natural aquifer explanation. Geological phenomena meant no liability, no negligence, no uncomfortable questions about inspection protocols. Others suspected the worst, that internal erosion pointed to design flaws or monitoring failures that institutions were desperate to hide. Climate change added another layer of complexity. Dams designed for 20th century hydrology now face stresses their builders never imagined. Extreme precipitation events, prolonged droughts, and temperature swings created conditions where the improbable became inevitable. Lake Oroville sits at the intersection of all these forces. Its embankment is over 50 years old, its spillways bear the scars of past crises, and its watershed responds to climate patterns that no longer match historical norms. Scientists now possess pieces of an incomplete puzzle, they know the water rose 23 feet without precipitation or visible inflow. They know the chemistry points to deep origins. They know fault structures could theoretically provide conduits. They know drainage anomalies suggest internal changes. What they don't know might destroy them. Will the source exhaust itself or continue indefinitely? Has the dam's structural integrity been compromised? Will the next surge be larger, faster, more destructive? In a state where water is life and death, where millions depend on this single reservoir, one question haunts every expert studying the data. If these warnings are real, if something fundamental has broken beneath California's most critical dam, will anyone act before it's too late? The water keeps rising, the clock keeps ticking, and somewhere in the depths below Lake Oroville, forces beyond human control are reshaping California's future one mysterious gallon at a time. That's it for today, folks. See you in the next video.